Food is one of the many necessities of life. However, food may also be the source of sickness. Foodborne illnesses affect one in six Americans every single year. And the signs and symptoms of these illnesses can range in severity from, some, from relatively minor symptoms such as an upset stomach or diarrhea to potentially life-threatening conditions such as hemolytic, ure, hemolytic uremic syndrome. In this video, we're going to talk about how we can prevent, uh, prevent foodborne illnesses, whether it's in, uh, in a food production setting or even in our home. And we'll learn how to properly prepare, store, and process foods in ways that can help to reduce the risk of foodborne infections. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Our food contains the vital nutrients that our bodies need in order to survive. But our food may also contain harmful pathogens such as bacteria and viruses and worms or toxins that can make us seriously ill. Pathogens and toxins can come from a lot of different sources and we'll talk about those at length in this video. But what's important to note is that all food has the potential to become infected with pathogens or contain toxins produced by some of these pathogenic species. They can be contaminated during the processing process. They can be contaminated during the packaging phase. They can be contaminated during distribution, or they can even be contaminated within our own home. For example, raw meat, fish, poultry could contain harmful pathogens such as bacteria that could be spread to other foods if they're improperly stored or improperly prepared utilizing shared utensils. In this video, we're gonna explore the different sources of these pathogens identify some of these pathogens, and talk about what foodborne illnesses actually look like. Now, as I said in the introduction, foodborne illnesses impact one in six Americans every single year. And the signs and symptoms of foodborne illnesses can range from the relatively benign, upset stomach, uh, nausea, maybe some vomiting, to more serious consequences like uh, severe diarrhea that could lead to de dehydration and even death, or a serious condition known as hemolytic uremic syndrome. The pathogens that are contained in our food come from all different branches of life, from single-celled prokaryotes such as bacteria, to more complex organisms such as worms and fungi. They can even be caused by single-celled eukaryotic species known as parasites, parasitic protozoa. So how do they get to our food in the first place? Well, the answer is it depends on where, uh, what type of pathogen we're talking about. Many foods can be contaminated simply because they're contained within the animal that produces the product that we're talking about. For example, around, species, around poultry, chicken, and other fowl, um, salmonella is a very common bacteria found in the gut of these species, and it's very common for that to be contained within the meat. Escherichia coli is commonly found in the gut of, of cows, which is why we have to be careful around raw beef, because they may contain that. But it's also possible for vegetables, uh, fresh produce and stuff to be contaminated with this because of fertilizer or because of how they're handled during the processing and packaging of these goods. So it's important that as consumers that we adequately wash and prepare our foods to help prevent these particular illnesses from being spread to ourselves and to our loved ones. The Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, has identified over 250 different distinct foodborne illnesses. These foodborne illnesses are roughly broken down into two categories. One are infections. These are caused by species such as bacteria, viruses, protozoan, or worms. And the nature of the illness is caused by the fact that these particular, uh, particular microbes are present in the host and multiplying in such a way to cause an illness. It's really no different than any other type of infection, including influenza or a cold uh, or a bacterial infection like strep throat except they are brought to, into the host via their gastrointestinal tract, uh, typically through their gastrointestinal tract by the consumption of food. The other major category are intoxications, and this is what happens when somebody is exposed to a toxin. This could be a toxin produced by a poisonous fungus, or it could be the byproduct of the metabolism of a living organism uh, that has been growing or living inside of the food, and it's the actual toxin itself that's causing the illness. The extent and severity and nature of the illness are all, can, uh, that are all affected by several different conditions. For example, what is the nature of 
the illness? Is it an infection or is it an intoxication? How much of the infectious agent or intoxicant was the person exposed to? And what is the mechanism of action? How does this actual infection or intoxicant affect the host's body? All of these factors play a role as well as how, how naturally healthy the individual is. So just like all sicknesses, if you are already in an immune compromised condition because you're tired, um, you're, you're already ill with some other thing, uh, if your immune defenses are down, you're much more likely to develop se severe signs and symptoms of a foodborne illness than you would be if you were otherwise healthy. First, we'll start with the infections. The majority of foodborne illnesses are related to a group of single-celled microbes known as bacteria. Some of the major bacterial causes of foodborne illnesses include Escherichia coli, also known as E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter jejuni, Listeria minocytogenes. All of these are bacteria that can be found in food and can cause infections if you're exposed in sufficient amounts or under the right conditions. One of the reasons bacterial infections are so common, uh, commonly the cause of foodborne illnesses, is that they can typically go unnoticed because they don't have a drastic effect either on the texture, the smell, or the appearance of food. We'll see with fungi, molds, for example, there often is a big change in the appearance of food, so it's very easy to notice when there has been a fungal contamination of your food products. However, with bacteria, that isn't the case. And we know that many foods naturally contain bacterial species, meat, for example, which is why when we get meat, we either need to freeze it or store it in refrigerated condition. The thing to realize is this, freezing or refrigerating food doesn't actually kill the bacteria. It simply puts them into a source of uh, a, a sense of stasis. In other words, it slows down their development. But once that meat has returned to normal temperature or has thawed from the freezer, those bacterial species are, are not dead. In fact, they sort of reanimate themselves and begin to go back to their normal life cycle of eating and dividing. And very rapidly, many food products can become dangerously infected uh, with these species and can lead to severe illness. So it's very important when we're trying to control bacterial, bacterial growth conditions that we try to stay out of the danger zone. The danger zone refers to conditions that, more, that allow the rapid growth and reproduction of bacterial species. Some of the key factors in controlling microbial growth include temperature. As I just mentioned, most of the bacteria that are pathogenic to human beings are able to grow at human body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Keeping bacteria out of room temperature or body temperature conditions for as long as possible is a very good way to help stave off bacterial, uh, bacterial growth. Keeping them refrigerated or frozen as long as possible and then cooking them to adequate temperatures to ensure that all remaining bacteria that, have, that were present are killed is a very important part of this. Bacteria also require water. They usually require some source of moisture. So, by, so one of the ways that we can preserve foods is by drying them out and denying the, denying the water that they need in order to survive. That's why things like dehydration can be so effective at preserving foods. They also use, they're also somewhat dependent on pH. One of the things we know is that, pH, that acidic foods tend to grow significantly less bacteria than those that are at a more neutral or basic pH or a higher pH value. Time is also a factor. The longer something is exposed to the danger zone, the longer that food is left at room temperature and exposed, especially food that we know contains bacterial species, the more likely that bacteria are to reach danger, dangerous levels within that food and more likely to cause foodborne illnesses. Oxygen is also a factor. Most of the microbes that cause foodborne illnesses, most of the bacteria, I should say, that cause foodborne illnesses depend on oxygen in order to survive. While there are some species that are anaerobic in nature, Many of them thrive better in aerobic conditions, oxygen-containing conditions, so depriving them of the needed oxygen, that's why processes such as canning and jarring and preserving foods can be so effective. We deny them the oxygen that they need in order to survive. Nutrient content can also be a factor. Microbes, just like us, need certain things in order to survive. They need, they need proteins and they need fats and they need carbohydrates in order for their metabolism to function as well. Being able to deny them some of those resources is another way to help prevent microbial growth and keep food protected. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the more common 
bacterial species involved in foodborne illnesses and kind of describe where we might be able to get them and how to prevent them and what it might look like if you become infected with one of these bacterial species. The first group of bacteria we'll talk about is Salmonella. So Salmonella is very commonly found in species of birds, reptiles, and some mammals. It typically lives inside of their intestine. Eating foods that are derived from these species, including eggs, uh, can be a source of salmonella uh, in our diets. People who are infected with salmonella will typically start showing signs and symptoms around 12 to 72 hours, and those symptoms will persist for anywhere from four days to seven days um, after they've become infected. This can include a high fever, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Typically, these symptoms will, uh, will subside uh, without medical intervention. However, in some cases, people that are immune compromised or um, have other conditions that may prevent their immune system from functioning properly may develop a severe infection with salmonella that could, provide, that could prove fatal if left untreated. The next species we'll talk about is a, a bacterium known as Listeria monocytogenes. So Listeria monocytogenes is a bit interesting. Most of the bacteria we talk about don't grow very well in refrigerated conditions, which means storing, storing things like chicken and beef at refrigerated temperatures for several days is, is typically okay. Listeria monocytogenes actually can grow uh, in temperatures at ranging from zero to 40 degrees Celsius, which means even inside of your refrigerator, Listeria monocytogenes can still continue to grow and reproduce. The disease it causes is listerosis, and it's commonly found in lunch meats, but it can also be found in soft cheeses, unpasteurized dairy products. Typically, listerosis only affects young children, infants, people with compromised immune systems, for example, people that are undergoing can cancer chemotherapy, um, but uh, in most people, it does not cause any f severe form of illness. Nausea, headache, vomiting are the common causes uh, and signs and symptoms. In severe cases, though, it is possible for immune-compromised people to develop a severe form of meningitis as a result of ingesting Listeria monocytogenes, which could prove fatal. Perhaps one of the best-known foodborne infectious agents is Escherichia coli, also known as E. coli. Now, there are several strains of E. coli that live inside of your intestine and are part of your normal microbiota. They help you process your foods and maintain normal health. However, there are some pathogenic strains that can be transferred from uh, food products to humans. These are typically found in meat-related products, but they can also be found in unpasteurized milk and other dairy products. But lately, there have, all, there have been infections, and most prominently, um, in leafy green vegetables. This is likely due to the transfer, uh, you know, how they're handled during the processing and packaging of these foods, or they could be coming from uh, manure uh, that has been used to help grow these foods. Escherichia coli inf uh, infection, when you get E. coli uh, from one of these pathogenic strains, typically you can get watery, bloody diarrhea, um, severe cramps, nausea, vomiting, um, along with that diarrhea. In many cases, these signs and symptoms will go away. However, certain strains of E. coli carry something known as shigatoxin, and this shigatoxin that's produced by these species have the ability to um, do severe damage to the intestines and cause a severe uh, urinary tract infection uh, where it begins to destroy the kidneys. This is known as hemolytic uremic syndrome. And uh, HUS, as it's abbreviated, HUS, um, can be fatal or can lead to complete kidney failure and the need for a uh, kidney transplant as a result of this particular type of infection. As a result, it's always a good idea to make sure that you thoroughly wash produce and you thoroughly cook um, beef products and, and don't consume unpasteurized dairy products as uh, E. coli infection can cause severe consequences, particularly in those who are immune compromised, as well as the very old and the very young. One potentially fatal foodborne illness is caused by a gram-positive rod-shaped bacterium known as Clostridium botulinum. As the name implies, uh, the disease you get from this is known as botulism. And while the toxin that causes botulism has been used medicinally, known as Botox, to treat things from, uh, from cluster headaches uh, to actually be used uh, in, term, in, way, in forms of sort of plastic surgery or, or cosmetics, um, botulism is a potentially fatal infection. This is typically acquired from improperly canned foods. Uh, so one of the things you might note about Clostridium botulinum is it's actually an anaerobic bacterium. And one of the things you want to watch out for is whether or not canned goods are bulging. If you see bulging or swelling of the cans, that may indicate uh, that it is contaminated with Clostridium botulinum. 
Clostridium botulinum, actually, uh, the signs and symptoms can appear anywhere uh, from 36 to 72 hours after you've consumed the food. But what you'll start to notice is actually a descending paralysis. So botulinum toxin actually affects the nerves that make your muscles work. And uh, eventually what will end up happening is these nerves won't be able to release proper neurotransmitters and the muscles will stop working. Uh, it may first start with uh, in, in the head region, so uh, drooping eyes, uh, difficulty swallowing, um, but eventually that, that paralysis will descend to the point where it impacts your diaphragm and your ability to breathe. And people who go untreated with botulism can actually die essentially from suffocation because their diaphragm becomes paralyzed and they're no longer able to breathe. One of the most common causes of, of, of diarrhea uh, in the world is a species of bacteria known as Campylobacter jejuni. This guy's a gram-negative uh, spiral-shaped bacterium um, that actually infects the upper portion of your small intestine. It's typically acquired uh, through meat, that through, through undercooked chicken, or things that have been contaminated with the juice of, of chicken. So uh, that's the most common cause, but it can also be uh, acquired through unpasteurized milk and dairy products. Um, or improperly uh, packaged foods that have been exposed uh, to implements that have been exposed to raw chicken or chicken juices. Uh, signs and symptoms usually appear between three and six days after having consumed it. Um, and what you may notice is nausea, cramps, vomiting, headache, uh, bloody diarrhea. Um, and again, uh, kind of like we saw with salmonella, very similar signs and symptoms. Um, they will quite often subside on their own. However, in some severe cases, particularly in people who are immune compromised, uh, they, the, they could be potentially fatal, uh, particularly the dehydration caused by the diarrhea uh, if it's left untreated. Shigella is another group of bacteria that are very similar to Salmonella and E. coli. They're gram-negative rods that typically reside in the intestine. Shigella actually isn't typically present in food unless that food has been handled improperly by somebody who themselves actually has Shigella. So quite often this is going through what we refer to as the fecal oral route. Uh, somebody maybe uses the bathroom, uh, doesn't wash their hands, and then contaminates food uh, with fecal matter um, and transfers that Shigella to the food. Usually that food needs to be moist or liquid uh, because that's how Shigella typically gets around. Um, but people that have that will develop signs and symptoms anywhere from one to seven days after being exposed to it. Um, again, what you'd expect from foodborne illnesses, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, that type of stuff. Uh, what's interesting is if you are exposed to Shigella, depending on what strain you get, you're probably going to be immune to that type of strain for a very long period of time. That being said, there are several different species of Shigella, Shigella that can cause um, food poisoning or foodborne illnesses. So you're immune to that one species, but you're not immune to other species. Uh, so uh, again, this goes to show that it's very important how, how people handle food. And uh, it's one of those reasons why when you go to the bathroom at restaurants, you'll see the employees must wash hands before returning to work uh, signs. And that's why you have state mandates and federal mandates that require those postings because this is one of the diseases that can be spread when people don't adequately wash their hands and observe proper sanitary protocols. Another foodborne illness is caused by a gram-positive staphylococcus known as staphylococcus aureus. You may recognize staphylococcus aureus as the SA portion of MRSA. Now to be clear, there are, MRSA is a very specific strain of staphylococcus aureus that is resistant to most antibiotics. However, Staphylococcus itself, uh, even the strains that aren't MRSA or Versa, can cause foodborne illnesses. Um, most people are, don't harbor Staphylococcus aureus as part of their normal microbiota because it is a true pathogen. It really shouldn't be present in your body at any time. However, people who do carry around Staphylococcus aureus and don't wash their hands prior to preparing food can transfer this to food. There are a host of different foods that you can get this from. Basically, anything that was handled by somebody with Staphylococcus aureus um, that didn't use gloves or didn't wash their hands. Now, to be clear, this is not a fecal oral transfer like we saw with Shigella. Staphylococcus aureus typically lives in our uh, mucous membranes or on our skin. Uh, so it could be something as simple as somebody sneezing where they shouldn't sneeze or, uh, you know, wiping their wipe using their sleeve to wipe their nose uh, something like that and transferring it to the food so uh, there are lots of ways this can happen signs and symptoms again typical of what we see with food related infections nausea vomiting cramps diarrhea um, usually appearing within 8 to 24 hours after you've been exposed these symptoms will typically subside in one to two days the last species of bacteria that we'll talk about here is Vibrio volnificus. So 
Vibrio is actually, Vibrio vulnificus is closely related to Vibrio cholerae. Uh, both of these are actually found in water, and that's how cholera spreads, which is not a foodborne illness per se, it's a waterborne illness. But Vibrio vulnificus can actually spread from seafood, oysters, for example, that are eaten raw and aren't prepared accordingly. Uh, the foodborne version of this infection can be serious in people with underlying health conditions. Um, again, nausea, vomiting, uh, cramps, uh, very similar signs and symptoms to food poisoning. One interesting thing about Vibrio vulnificus is Vibrio vulnificus can also enter into the bloodstream. So uh, let's say you're shucking oysters or cutting open clams or crayfish. Um, and some of that Vibrio vulnificus gets into your bloodstream, it is actually possible for a Vibrio vulnificus to cause a fatal bloodstream infection and even flesh-eating flesh bacteria known as necrotizing fasciitis. So Vibrio vulnificus is one of the, the flesh-eating bacteria uh, that you hear of in terms of uh, the disease known as necrotizing fasciitis. To be fair, this is a very rare complication associated with Vibrio vulnificus, but it is possible. Viruses may also be present in food, although infections, uh, food contained with viruses is typically less prominent than we see with bacteria. The thing to note about viruses is this. Unlike bacteria and the other pathogens we're going to talk about, viruses aren't considered to be living things. They can't reproduce without a host cell. So what often happens is human contamination is the cause. The virus is the virus. Humans contaminate the food product with the virus. And then when that food is consumed at that point, um, then the host can be infected with that virus. Two of the most common viral uh, infections caused by uh, transmitted through food are hepatitis A and the norovirus. So hepatitis A, like all hepatitis is, targets the liver. It is typically spread by people who have hepatitis A and then contaminate food uh, by not washing their hands after they go to the bathroom. Again, similar to what we saw with Shigella, that fecal oral root. Hepatitis A can, uh, can actually uh, occur, uh, can lead to outbreaks of hepatitis A. One of the reasons why is hepatitis A doesn't immediately show signs and symptoms, so people who have the infection may not know it. It's not uncommon for there to be localized outbreaks of it tied to a single restaurant or a single manufacturing process. And the reason why is if somebody has hepatitis A and then contaminates the food, then everybody who consumes it um, is exposed to hepatitis A. And since there really is no vaccination against hepatitis A, uh, most of us are vulnerable to the disease. The good news is that hepatitis A very rarely causes a fatal form of hepatitis. Nevertheless, um, in immune compromised individuals, the very young and the very old, um, it, is, uh, it is possible for hepatitis A to be fatal or lead to very severe health complications. The norovirus gets its name from uh, being the Norwalk-like virus. Now the norovirus is typically transmitted um, either directly from human to human or through contaminated water. The norovirus is actually the most common, trans, commonly transmitted viral infection uh, through food. It is transferred by, from people who have the virus um, and then prepare food and, can, and, and then uh, other people consume it. The norovirus, also known as the Norwalk-like virus, causes a severe form of gastroenteritis. It causes nausea and vomiting, um, and this can be very severe for a period of 24 to 48 hours. Afterwards, you're likely to develop a fairly high fever, um, extreme fatigue, and very painful, uh, you know, very painful body aches and chills. Um, uh, a few years ago, uh, my entire family was down with the norovirus. We don't really know where we got it from, but I can tell you that hands down, the norovirus was one of the worst illnesses I've ever had, um, and I hope nobody encounters it. Again, this could be uh, this uh, can be prevented uh, through adequate preparation of food, but then again, you don't necessarily know whether food needs to be uh, needs to be cooked or not. So, for example, if somebody who has norovirus um, prepares you a salad, you're not going to cook it, and you're going to be exposed to the virus. This viral infection does appear to be more severe in adults than children. So, adults typically end up with more severe signs and symptoms than children do. From viruses, we'll move back on to living species. Uh, the species we'll talk about next are the protozoans. So protozoans are single-celled eukaryotes. You may remember from some of your biology classes or maybe some of my other videos, life is broken down into two types of cells, prokaryotic cells, which are the simple ones that lack a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. These are what bacteria and their cousin species, the archaea, are. We, along with protozoans, plants, other animals, fungi, are eukaryotes. We have nuclei and we have uh, membrane-bound organelles such as mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum and a Golgi apparatus. 
Protozoans are single cell versions of eukaryotic cells. And in a sense, they're actually very similar to us. This is one of the reasons why they're actually so hard to treat medically, uh, because a lot of the drugs that we would use to get rid of protozoan parasites would also harm our host cells as well. We'll talk about four species of protozoans that actually cause foodborne related illnesses. The first one is Cryptosporidium. So Cryptosporidium lives in the intestine of infected mammals and uh, it could live in, uh, in, in livestock such as cattle, sheep, and pigs, but it can also live in the intestines of humans. And typically Cryptosporidium, uh, which causes the disease Cryptosporidiosis, is spread through, uh, spread through drinking water. And it could be because water is being improperly treated at the, at the treatment center, or it could be because you're drinking uh, a water from a natural source such as a well, and somehow animal feces or something else has gotten into this. Now, cryptosporidium, cryptosporidium do, typically causes very similar signs and symptoms to most food-related illnesses, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And in most individuals, this, their body will be able to fight off this particular protozoan and the infection will subside. However, um, people who are immunocompromised, in particular people who have HIV AIDS, are very susceptible to developing a fatal infection as a result of this. As a result, it's very important that local treatment plants are, are properly or adequately prepared uh, to make sure that any cryptosporidium in the drinking water is removed. The next protozoan we'll talk about is Jardia lamblia. So Jardia lamblia is found in freshwater sources throughout the United States. And since most of our drinking water comes from these freshwater sources, it's possible uh, to acquire this through contaminated drinking water. It's very unlikely that you're going to get it through a municipal water supply. But Jardia lamblia is one of the reasons why you should not be drinking uh, un un uncleansed uh, like lake water or stream water, which is why you should boil it if you're out camping and you get water from the stream boil it. Don't just, when you're on a fishing trip, don't just reach into the lake and, and, and drink water that way because you may be picking up Jardia lamblia cysts that once they get into your intestine can cause an infection. Nausea, vomiting, gas, uh, diarrhea are all symptoms associated with it. Again, like we saw with crypto, uh, cryptosporidium, most people will be able to rid themselves of this infection. However, it can also be treated by antibiotics um, that will make, just like cryptosporidium, which will make the infection pass uh, significantly faster. And again, most people are likely to uh, have very few uh, long-term consequences associated with this infection. However, if you are immune, immunocompromised for some reason, this particular infection could prove more dangerous. The other common place for Jardia lamblia to be spread is within daycares or child care centers. And the reason why is it does go through the fecal oral route. The major, so major source of uh, of Jardia lamblia is mammalian intestines. And since we are mammals, we can also harbor Jardia lamblia. Kids don't always, uh, don't always have the best um, hygiene as we speak. So it's much more likely for kids to, you know, touch that part of their body and then maybe touch a toy. And then some other kid puts that toy in their mouth or, you know, uh, that scenario isn't that unlikely in a healthcare or, or I'm sorry, in a daycare setting. Um, so consequently, it, it is it is fairly common for Jardia lamblia outbreaks to happen in these settings as well. This brings us to Toxoplasma gondii. So Toxoplasma gondii is actually the leading cause of death attributed to foodborne related illnesses. This is interesting because uh, most people who have been exposed or are infected with Toxoplasma gondii have almost no symptoms. Estimates of, upward, of upwards of 60 million people are infected with Toxoplasma gondii, and most of them won't have any severe consequences. Now, Toxoplasma gondii can be transmitted through the consumption of undercooked food products, uh, undercooked meat products, I should say, uh, you know, beef, poultry, and the like. However, it's also possible to acquire Toxoplasma gondii from, from cat feces. So one of the things that's often, uh, often told to women who are thinking about coming, becoming pregnant or who are pregnant is that they really shouldn't be changing litter boxes. Now, typically it's okay as long as the litter is changed every 20, less on like a 24 hour cycle because the ability of, the, the bat, of this protozoan to reproduce um, it doesn't reprodu typically reproduce in high enough amounts uh, in that time to cause any signs or symptoms. But the reason why we're concerned about women who are pregnant or who may become pregnant is that it is possible uh, for Toxoplasma gondii to actually cross the placental barrier and cause birth defects in the developing fetus. So that's why you may find that if you do become pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant, you may be advised to have someone else handle the kitty litter in your home.
The last species we'll talk about is a protozoan known as Cyclospora chiatinensis. So Cyclospora chiatinensis, again, is a protozoan. Um, it is typically found on produce. So it is, again, spread through, um, usually through the contamination with feces. And one of the major sources of Cyclospora are fruits that don't typically get washed very well because they're hard. So things like berries, raspberries, blackberries, things that are very fragile. And as a result, don't typically get washed as well as uh, something like an apple um, or a tomato might get washed for fear of damaging the fruit. This actually is spread uh, most commonly through human feces. So it could be during the harvesting process or it could be during the packaging process where this contamination occurs. Um, in some countries where this produce is 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 grown, um, it's not uncommon for farmers to uh, illegally fertilize their crops with what's politely known as night soil or human feces. Uh, again, our feces contains roughly the same um, nutrition uh, for, for those plants that you know, cattle feces commonly used as manure is. However, it's usually forbidden and outlawed because it's a very easy way to spread human-based infections, as we can see in the case of Cyclospora chiatinensis. Again, cyclos Jesus. Again, Cyclospora chiatinensis can cause an infection. That infection typically resolves itself um, either by itself or with pharmaceutical intervention and really only causes severe signs and symptoms in immunocompromised patients. Food may also be contaminated with another group of eukaryotes that you probably know as worms. We often refer to in the scientific community as helminths. So uh, one of the more common types of worms to actually be, tr be transmitted belong to a group of worms called the tapeworms. Tapeworms tend to infect species in a species-specific species pattern. So for example, uh, Tinea solium is found in pork. Uh, Tinea saginata is found inside of beef. Diphilobothrium latum is found in fish. Um, the eggs infect the host species. Um, they begin to develop in the intestine, and then the uh, mature tapeworm latches on to the intestinal wall and begins sapping nutrients from the host in order to survive. There's also another type of worm known as Trichinella spiralis. Um, this worm can be acquired through the consumption of undercooked meat um, and actually can embed itself and grow into this little spiral shape inside of the muscle cells. Now, while we're typically a dead end host for, uh, trichin uh, for Trichinella spiralis, um, it, it actually can infect tissues in like the heart and other essential muscles and paralyze them and, and cause those muscles to malfunction, which could actually prove to be fatal. So it's very important that we don't eat undercooked pork or fish or undercooked meat uh, in general because it could contain um, it could contain these worm pathogens, which then can go on to cause a serious infection. We'll now move on to another branch of eukaryotic life, fungi. So typically, when we refer to fungi, we're talking about molds. So molds actually can infect up to 25% of food products throughout the world. Um, so mold contamination is a real issue in the food processing industry. When it comes to molds, we're not really worried about the mold themselves infecting the human host uh, for the most part. Instead, we're worried about the toxins that they produce. Molds are known to produce two different types of toxins that can be harmful to humans, aflatoxins and mycotoxins. We'll start with the aflatoxins. So aflatoxins can be produced by species of mold that infect things like peanuts, tree nuts, and corn. And the aflatoxin can make somebody very sick, but most importantly, it appears to have a pretty pronounced effect on the liver, and it can actually lead to complete liver failure um, if exposed for, in high enough quantities or for a long, prolonged period of time, and as such, could prove to be fatal. Mycotoxins are also quite common, and when you think about poisonous mushrooms, this is what we're worried about. Some mycotoxins can cause minor food-related illnesses, such as an upset stomach, diarrhea, things that you'd expect. Others can actually be potent neurotoxins that can actually kill somebody if they're exposed. So one of the big things to watch out for if you're consuming poison, if you're consuming mushrooms, make sure that you have a proper guide. Some of these species are so toxic that they also they actually have names uh, like death caps and destroying angel. While they may be beautiful and while they may actually taste good in some cases, some of these are fatal. And some of the ways they kill you is by destroying your kidneys or by destroying your liver, similar to the way that aflatoxin does. And they can be fatal in a matter of hours as they destroy your body. So unlike we saw with most with bacterial species, uh, the viruses and the, and the protozoans and the worms, when we talk about mushrooms, we're not really referring to so much as an infection, but what we're really for, referring to as an intoxication. Again, some of them have consequences that are severe as severe infections.
Intoxication can also come from an exposure to chemicals. Many crop species are actually grown in the presence of pesticides, and these pesticides are designed to help crops from being destroyed by pests, such as uh, grasshoppers or cicadas or bacteria that infect plant species or other things that may damage crop yield. However, these pesticides are in fact chemicals, and while they are regulated um, by the government, some of these pesticides can actually be harmful, especially if consumed in high enough quantities. This is yet another reason why when you consume fresh produce, you should absolutely wash it to remove these harmful pesticides. Other, other pollutants that may cause intoxications include things like polychlorobiphenols or PCBs, dioxins, metals, and methylmercury. These can be found in various types of food and exposure to high concentrations of any of these chemicals can have profound effects on human health. They can even hinder development or cause fatal illnesses. For example, high exposure to methylmercury can cause, uh, can cause fatal, mercury, fatal mercury levels inside the body and can lead to death. Because foodborne illnesses are such a problem and can cause such severe consequences, it comes as no surprise that there are several government agencies that are in charge of making sure that our food is safe to consume. One of these agencies is the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. The FDA is actually given the authority to approve all ingredients that go into food, and they're also responsible for producing uh, food safety labels and making sure that the food we eat doesn't contain things that are harmful to us. As a result, the FDA actually has the authority to issue product recalls. So if the FDA detects that something is going on, that there's a safety-related issue, the FDA can actually step in and, call, and issue recalls of products. You may, for example, have heard uh, of when there's E. coli contamination in certain, you know, in spinach, for example, the FDA may issue a, a federal recall banning the sale of spinach from certain sources or just altogether in the interest of the public health. However, it should be noted that uh, the FDA very rarely has to use their authority to do this. Most food product recalls are done voluntarily, and this is because most food, uh, most food companies uh, or food uh, processing companies recognize that it's just good business not to kill people or make them sick. It's not a very good PR story uh, when your particular food causes people to get seriously ill or die. Nevertheless, if a, food producer, if a food producer fails to do this, the FDA can step in and, off and, and require an involuntary recall. The USDA, or U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is headed by the Secretary of Agriculture, also helps to protect our food systems. Uh, the USDA is really in charge of um, making sure that the laws that govern uh, agriculture and ranchers are, are enforced. They can step in and make sure that food is being produced properly, that farms aren't utilizing um, certain pesticides or aren't putting harmful things inside of livestock that can cause illnesses. The USDA is also tasked with pro uh, protecting our natural resources and ensuring that our trade agreements are in place to ensure that food products that exit the United States or food products that are brought in uh, from other countries meet, meet the required guidelines uh, and, and, are not, that, and will not be harmful uh, to United States citizens. The other, thing, the other major organization that's involved is the EPA. So the Environmental Protection Agency doesn't have a ton to do with food directly. However, they are essential and required to oversee water safety. So uh, their job is to make sure that our municipal water supplies um, are safe. They're free from harmful microbes and other contaminants that can cause sickness. As a result, they do play a role in public health by making sure that water sources are free from the microbes that can cause infection or that livestock aren't exposed uh, to things in the water uh, that could potentially lead to infections in human beings once they become food. Because of the potential of foodborne illnesses, the food processing industry is under strict scrutiny and there are strict guidelines uh, that dictate how food has to be handled, produced, and packaged properly. One of the most common means for ensuring that the food is produced, packaged, and handled safely is known as Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Points, or HACCP. HACCP has a seven-step approach to identifying all of the steps in the processing, packaging, and retail of food where contamination can occur. And you can see this here on this infographic. The USDA requires anybody who handles meat and poultry to follow these HACCP guidelines while the FDA requires uh, producer, uh, manufacturers and processors of seafood, some canned goods, and juices uh, to follow HACCP guidelines. 
all other food related industries are a, are allowed to use HACCP if they choose to or not. However, most have adopted HACCP as a way of ensuring and protecting their production um, and, and preventing the outbreak of foodborne illnesses. Now, of course, foodborne illnesses have been around since human beings have been consuming food. And as a result, human beings have found very innovative ways to lengthen the shelf life of food. If you go back to uh, pre-modern times, things such as drying, salting, canning, jarring, uh, these are all ways in which, um, in simpler times, people were able to extend the lifespan of food. Now, we all know that some of those have their drawbacks, and they're not always perfect. For example, improper canning of food can, can lead to the growth of Clostridium botulinum, which can cause a fatal infection. And even, you know, even no matter how much you dry something out or salt something or cure it or whatever you're going to do with it, it does have a shelf life and will eventually, um, it will eventually no longer last. More modern approaches... Um, include things like pasteurization and irradiation. Uh, these are all ways that we seek in refrigeration. More modern approaches include things like irradiation, pasteurization, freezing, and refrigeration. These are all ways that we can extend the shelf life of food. But perhaps the greatest steps we've had in extending the lifespan of food have come through the food processing, the food processing industry. Now, processed foods have several benefits, but they also have several drawbacks. So the benefits of food processing is that very often they have ways of extending the shelf life of food. So fresh food does not last nearly as long as processed food. Of course, this also comes with the drawback that you have to include things like preservatives. So processed foods also often have high, high levels of things like salts and other preservatives uh, that help to deter the growth of bacteria and other infectious agents, but also may affect the flavor or the quality of the food, um, or may be unwanted amounts of, for example, sodium in processed foods. Because food processing can extend the shelf life of food, because it can prevent the growth, it ensures that harmful bacteria aren't present uh, and harmful other harmful pathogens aren't present in the food, it does actually help to protect the consumer's life. It also makes it easier to ship foods. It's much easier to, shelf, to ship canned goods uh, and, and frozen goods that have longer shelf lives than it is to ship fresh produce. And because of food processing technology, we've actually been able to provide foods to certain parts of the world that never would have seen it. Because, for example, it's not always possible to get fresh fish into the middle of Nebraska or into other parts of the world that aren't remotely close to where fresh fish might be caught. But the drawbacks do include the fact that Many, of, uh, many processed foods contain um, high amounts of things such as sodium, which we know uh, from some of my previous videos, um, most people get way too much of. They can include things like monosodium glutamate. They can include too much sugar. Um, all of these things can help to improve the flavor of food or preserve the flavor of food or deter the growth of microbes. But uh, there is an unwanted cost that some of these things are being, that we consume in and for example, sodium is consumed um, in higher quantities than should be needed, or we're getting added sugar where it shouldn't be there in the first place. As I just mentioned, food additives are commonly used in the food processing industry. Uh, there are over 300 approved food additives. They are typically utilized to extend the shelf life of certain foods, but they can also be used to improve the nutritional content of foods, improve the texture or the consistency or the color of certain foods. Um, the, the, the big thing to note about this, food additives are generally regarded as safe. Um, it's illegal for, uh, for food manufacturers to include food additives if they haven't been approved by the FDA. Um, and it is also illegal for food, uh, for food processors to include food additives that are knowingly toxic to humans or are carcinogenic in nature. Nevertheless, uh, some of these food additives do have certain drawbacks, as I described before, you know, high levels of sodium or um, the use of certain dyes that people can be allergic to or have reactions to. But we'll wrap it up with maybe what's most important to us. Food safety isn't just the purview of the food processing agency or of meat packers or of, of the, the produce harvesters. It's also your, your, your personal responsibility as well. We all have to be safe in how we prepare our food. We need to make sure that we're washing our produce properly to prevent any contamination from intoxicants or from bacteria or other things that can cause illness. We need to make sure that we adequately cook our foods properly to make sure that any potential pathogens found in there are cooked to the point where they're no longer alive and no longer harmful to us. We need to make sure that we are making the right choices about where we get our food. Buy your food from reputable grocers. Don't just 
go and buy the cheapest stuff that you can find um, or meat that's past its expiration date just because it's cheaper. All of these things can, in doing so could increase your risk of developing foodborne illnesses. We also need to make sure that we handle our food properly. Never use cutting boards. Uh, you know, share cutting boards with meat, with animal products, with produce. One gets cooked and the other one doesn't. So it's okay if you get meat juice in, on the knife and the cutting board, as long as you wash it and clean it appropriately before you then cut up the lettuce and, and, and the radishes and the onions that you're gonna use for your salad. Because the salad's not gonna be cooked. The meat is gonna be cooked, so any bacteria that are in there, for example, Escherichia coli or Salmonella, these are gonna be cooked to the point where they're dead. The salad is not gonna get cooked and it's very common for people to share utensils or share a cutting board and not appropriately clean them in between. Therefore, they're contaminating other foodstuffs with the, the bacteria that won't be a problem once the meat has been cooked. Food safety is everyone's responsibility. And if you're cooking for yourself, if you're cooking for others, it's very important that we observe good hygiene, that we wash our hands before and after preparing food. We wash our hands whenever we touch, um, whenever we touch food that could be potentially be contaminated and making sure that we're not uh, contaminating utensils and food with our own uh, bodily fluids or uh, bodily contaminants. So as, as you can see through this video, uh, there are lots of different causes of foodborne illness, but with proper care, with proper attention, with proper handling, many of these foodborne illnesses could be avoided or prevented. Thank you so much for tuning in for my video on food safety. I hope you learned a lot. Um, food safety is a very important aspect of food processing and of our nutrition. As I said in the intro, food contains the nutrients that are vital for our survival, but if improperly handled or improperly cooked or prepared, uh, food could be a source of potentially fatal illnesses. I hope you learned a lot. Thanks for tuning in and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye.